Okay, thanks for coming out. So as David said, um, I've been doing a variety of experiments um, that pertain to certain areas of philosophical debate. I'll just, instead of providing a broad overview of what the, that whole general activity is all about, let me just jump right into this particular study. Um, <clears throat> the idea that people might think that what's true for you What's right for you might be different than what's true for me or what's right for you plays a large role in philosophy. Not because you find many philosophers actually endorsing the view, um, but it comes up in a variety of places. First of all, in our teaching, in every introduction to philosophy class, in every introductory ethics class, this view known as relativism, it's characterized by this slogan and some others I'll give you, this comes up. Um, it might be the relativization in question might be to, uh, relativiz relativization toward, to a culture so, such that what's right for your culture may not be what's right for my culture. Um, they're all normal world absolutes. These kinds of slogans sort of loosely characterize the view that we call relativism. Most people are relativist about ethics, not so much physics and chemistry. You have to be a humanities professor to think that relativism about uh, physics and chemistry is a reasonable idea, but the average person, if they're going to be a relativist about something, uh, is going to, it's going to be, they're going to limit these kinds of claims to the, to the domain of ethics primarily. So, <clears throat> we philosophy professors think that this kind of view is prevalent among college freshmen and sophomores, but importantly, uh, it's taken to be a non-starter philosophically. So if, if, you, if you ever take intro to ethics, or intro to philosophy, let's just stick, stick with intro to ethics. In introductory ethics, you're going you're to encounter a wide variety of views. There's going to be a lot of disagreement. At the end of the semester, you won't know what's right or wrong because there will be so many views on the table. And your professor will be primarily neutral about it. Your professor is going to be primarily neutral about whether virtue, morally good habits or dispositions, is the fundamental ethical concept, or whether consequences are the fundamental ethical concept, um, or whether you shouldn't care about consequences, you should just look for what your moral duty is and just do that regardless of the consequences. Your professors is going to be very neutral about these views, but they're not going to be neutral about relativism. They're going to think that at the beginning of the semester, this is not just our, I mean this is, this is a nationwide phenomenon. Uh, I don't know if it's worldwide, but I certainly, it's certainly nationwide. Your philosophy professor is going to think that these kinds of, relativism needs to be stamped out at the very beginning of the semester. And then, a variety of views that the professor disagrees with are going to be put on the table, but they'll at least be sort of reasonable alternatives. Okay, so this relativism, whatever it is, I'll say more about what it is, is supposed to be a non-starter. <clears throat> uh, it's viewed as contradict, easy to rule out because it's self-contradictory, like if you say there are no absolute truths in ethics, somebody's going to say, hey, is that an absolute truth in ethics, and maybe there's a contradiction there. Some people think that these relativists contradict themselves in the following way. Well, there are no absolute truths in ethics, so they say something sort of general about relativism, but then they go on to make some normative ethical judgments. Stealing is wrong. These two conjunctions may not be obviously contradictory, but it's often claimed that they are implicitly so. You can't do both. You can't be a relativist and then go on in the next breath and say, well, some things are wrong, and just end period, end with a period. Um, so there's a philosophical debate about this. I've recently written uh, an interpretation of the folk moral relativism view, not because I think it's right. I don't defend it. I just am trying to get clear on what it is. I try to argue that there's philosophers have, you know, anytime you've got philosophers all on one side of an issue and there's not really a living philosopher really on the other side, and, you know, maybe one comes along every blue moon, that's just a recipe for uh, straw man proliferation. Um, so I, th I think that um, um, I think it's important to get clear on. So what do ordinary people actually view? Do they actually think in some something like relativistic terms? And <coughs> what are the what's the sort of structure of the relativism? What sort of shape does it have? And these are empirical questions, and they can't be. Uh, you know, they're empirical questions. So um, okay, another way that relativism crops up in philosophy is not just in teaching. So what I've said so far concerns teaching, but in the theoretical debate, relativism comes up as well, or it's opposite. So famously, J.L. Mackey um, claimed that the ordinary user, the ordinary person, not the ordinary philosopher, just the ordinary person who just makes m moral judgments, uses moral language, they mean to say something about a possible action, 
you know, as it is in itself, not rel one that's something that's absolute, not relativized to anything else. This is just a long-winded way of saying he thinks that people, the ordinary, the ordinary person's view of morality has it that when I say stealing is wrong, you should keep your promises. I'm stating facts, just like when we say something about the earth is round, the atomic number of gold is 79, or something like that. Those are, those are, fa those are statements that purport to express a fact. And um, <clears throat> amongst, th theoretical, uh, amongst philosophers doing work in philosophical ethics, the claim is ordinary people think of moral judgments just like that as somehow stating a fact. Michael Smith, who we're going to invite out a year from now, exactly a year from, well, yeah, yeah, exactly a year from now, pay him a nice, nice little sum of money. Uh, he's going to, he, he, he has this to say, ordinary folks seem to think questions have correct answers. Correct answers are made correct by objective moral facts. He says all this in a book called The Moral Problem. What's that problem? Well, it's composed of three things that don't go together very well. Three things that characterize our ordinary moral practice. Moral objectivity is one of them. Moral judgments are beliefs about matters of fact. <clears throat> And then there's a couple of other things that don't fit so well with that. Like, he claims that our ordinary practice, this is not necessarily his view, he thinks all by himself, he thinks this is just the view amongst, you know, people out there. Moral judgments motivate those who make them, but beliefs don't seem to be able to motivate you all on their own. How do these three things to get, fit together? He's got a book about it. Okay, well, here's what I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> the folk are not objectivists. Um in the way that philosophers think. And that this has Im <coughs> sort of important consequences for how we teach philosophy, for how we have this theoretical debate here. What, what is Michael Smith's evidence for moral objectivity? What is J.L. Mackey and many others evidence for moral objectivity? Well, there's no experiments that they've done or have read or much less heard about, right? Uh, or there's no ethnography, there's no non-experimental design here. So they think they can tell, they can just tell, you should just trust them. They can just tell uh, that this empirical claim is true. So my radical view is that empirical claims require empirical support. Um, <clears throat> and so some people have, myself included, have begun to try to um, investigate the respects in which the folk, that's just an abbreviation for the ordinary person, maybe in this culture, maybe in others. <clears throat> Are they objectivists? Do they think that when I say stealing is wrong, you should keep your promises, etc., that, that these are statements of fact, just like scientific statements about the physical world are statement of facts? Or are they more like something else, like chocolate is, really is, or chocolate is better than strawberry, Beethoven's a better musician than Britney Spears? In these la in these latter, in the, these latter, with these latter two claims, it, it's not so clear that there's a fact there, right, in the same sort of way, certainly with chocolate and strawberry. I thought it's fairly factual about Beethoven and Britney Spears, so that actually, I actually included that statement in our study. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the question is, uh, are the folk relativists or objectivists? I'm going to show you some, some experimental results that suggest they're relativists in important ways. And anyway, we'll have to set Michael Smith straight when he comes, perhaps. I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> Let me just briefly mention something about a, a distinction we make in philosophy between metaethics and normative ethical judgments. So on the one hand, when you're saying stealing is wrong, and maybe even saying why is stealing wrong? Well, it's wrong because you, know, you say something about the greatest happiness for the greatest number. You say something about rights. Um, you're doing something in the neighborhood that we call uh, normative ethics. But if you were to say something like this, stealing is wrong, that claim, it applies or is true for all people in all times and all places. Or um, statement stealing is wrong expresses an objective fact. Or maybe uh, it, it just expresses your feelings in some respect. If you make any kind of claims like that, this is what we call meta-ethical claims. You're not, when you do meta-ethics, this is a very loose characterization. It's very, uh, our, the guy who does meta-ethics in our department isn't here. That's probably good because this is very loose characterization, very overly simplistic. But roughly speaking, when you're, when, you make, when you're doing meta-ethical reflection, you're not really thinking about, is stealing really wrong or right? That's just not your concern. And you're not really concerned with the quality of reasons people are giving for stealing is wrong. You're concerned, something about, you're concerned with this larger, more abstract, more theoretical question about 
the nature of moral claims in general. Okay, so, so there's, been some past, there's been a lot of past research on moral psychology, of course, throughout the history of psychology. Before there was psychology, of course, the, the, the great dead philosophers had things to say uh, that we now classify as moral psychology. Some recent, uh, more famous work on, psycho uh, on moral psychology, I thought I would just briefly mention just to note some differences with what I'm the research I'm about to present today. So obviously uh, Lawrence Kohlberg was very influential with his theory of moral development. Um, all I want to say about that is he's not primarily focused on meta-ethical issues. He's focusing on, focus, by focusing on the reasons people gave in support of their claims and then classifying them according to some his stages of development, according to the kinds of reasons he, they gave, um, he's, he's really focused more on normative ethics. And you can perhaps, you could maybe, some people do try to, to derive people's meta-ethical views from what you say about why is stealing wrong and then you give a reason and then we can maybe categorize the reason you gave as a more objective or less subjective kind of reason you could perhaps do that that wasn't Kohlberg's focus and in any case it's indirect and the studies I'm going to describe to you are uh, more directly ad uh, address meta-ethical views uh, Turiel and his colleagues uh, looked importantly at something called the moral conventional distinction and at what age Children master this distinction between merely conventional norms, like you, uh, you should raise your hand in class before speaking, versus uh, other, other things, uh, more serious violations. So children recognize very early that um, if your teacher says, oh, you don't have to raise your hand before speaking today, children recognize, oh, then, then it's really, that makes it okay. But children recognize that if your teacher says, it's okay to hit Timmy in the face just because you feel like it, the children recognize it doesn't matter what the teacher says. So, so in any case, there's this famous body of work in moral psychology on the moral conventional distinction and how children are able to see that moral violations are more serious, more generalizable to like, it's not just right for you, but it's, you know, more across the board and less contingent on who says so. Uh, but again, this is, uh, this doesn't directly get at people's meta-ethical views, because in some other subsequent re research, um, some researchers have shown that people who explicitly deny moral objectivism, they deny that moral statements express facts, they still treat moral violations as more serious, more generalizable, less contingent on authority. So the moral conventional distinction can be um, preserved within a view that denies any real much objectivity uh, to, uh, to ethics. Okay, so okay. Let's, 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 I'll skip this last bit and we'll just get straight to it. So, um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, so one way that I got involved in this is I was already engaged in the philosophical debate about writing about relativism. Not defending it, just trying to argue with my philosophical colleagues that they've, the view they're attacking is not the view that the, the people actually hold. And then at the end of this, this happens all over America, the professor in intro to philosophy or intro to ethics will s squash, they think, relativism in the first week or two and then by the end of the semester when students go to write term papers what do you know they're defending relativism and so you'll hear hallway conversations between philosophers philosophy professors saying we 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 we've got rid of this i mean i thought we what's wrong with students today can't they think um okay because we we got rid of it we got it off the table so the reason why I think their attempts to soundly refute it in the first or second week of class fail is because they're, they're just not addressing the view that their student actually holds. They're maybe squashing some view, but it's not their student's view. Okay. So I was already involved in that debate. And then uh, I became aware of some research by Jeff Goodwin and John Darley. Those of you students in the room who are part of the cognitive science major, you've probably take, heard of a, in an intro to psych course or some course like this, you've probably heard of the bystander effect, such that when there's lots of people around witnessing a horrible act, someone getting stabbed over and over again and screaming for help, the more people there are around, the less responsible you feel for actually doing anything about it. So that, that's John Darley. He, uh, he made... He st studied that effect in the late 60s and uh, that was a famous contribution to social psychology. Okay, and, and Jeff Goodwin is one of his recent students, so Darley is still very, okay, still very active. So here's what they did, Goodwin and Darley, to study m the meta-ethical views of, of people. They had participants consider a variety of statements, statements like the ones you have on your handout, and then they asked them a, a meta-ethical question of some kind about it. So the statements here, I'm going to present to you the statements that I used, many of which overlap with Goodwin and Darley's, but not, not entirely. But the factual statements include this, things like this. Frequent exercise usually helps people to lose weight. 
People thought that was less factual a claim than any other factual claim. I don't know what's wrong with, you know, we, and we talk about Americans' diets and other habits, but maybe, I don't know, maybe there's something else wrong. Are they taking factual Well, I'll show you. I didn't actually use the word factual anywhere. Oh, you'll, you'll see. All right, so global warming is due primarily to human activity. Um, humans evolved from more primitive primate species. New York City is further north than Los Angeles. So I, I, I chose statements from three categories, factual, ethical, and taste claims. And, I, uh, so, not, and so, so David Sackers and I uh, tried intentionally to uh, get together statements that we, uh, of two kinds, two broad kinds. Statements where it's just, I mean, it's, there's no disagreement, there's no controversy, there's obviously a fact there. And then other statements where there's some perceived, disagree, there's some disagreement or controversy about it within our society. So in every case, we're, we try to get a mix. Um, anonymously donating a significant portion of your income to charity is morally good. Some other ethical statements concern stem cell research. Stem cell research is morally wrong. Abortion is morally permissible before the third month. Treating someone poorly on the basis of race, wrong. Taste claims are, this is a sample, McDonald's hamburgers better, taste better than hamburgers made at home. I thought, I chose this one, I, I thought this was a pretty, object, pretty objective <laughs> statement. People didn't seem to agree with me so much. I thought that's pretty objective, right? Brad Pitt's better looking, isn't that a, is that a fact? I thought that was a fact. Anyway, I know what you're supposed to say about taste claims, and yet I thought there's something factual like about that claim. Beethoven better than Brittany, okay. <clears throat> so again, I intentionally enclosed, in chose some taste claims that I thought were pretty clear, and then some where it's clearly up, up in the air. It's just your opinion. Okay, so, <clears throat> so my co-author, my co-investigator, David, David Sackers, and I, um, we read this article and discussed this article by Goodwin and Darley together, and it, what motivated us to begin our study, in addition to the other reasons I've given you, is the fact that we just noticed some some things that, we, that bothered us about their study and, and other related studies in the area. So here's, first of all, Goodwin and Darley presented these statements to people and asked them whether they agreed or disagreed. And then they presented the following, uh, test for objectivity, meta-ethical objectivity. How would you regard the previous statement? Circle the number. True statement, false statement, an opinion or attitude. So I thought this was very problematic for a number of reasons. Um, uh, before I say that, I should, I should note, so if a student asked, if a participant answered number one or number two, then they were scored as giving an objectivist answer. There's a fact there. If they, score, if they answered number three, they're scored as giving a non-objectivist answer. So one problem with this is that these answer choices are not uh, exclusive as Goodwin is certainly thinking that they are. Some opinions can be true, some false. The ordinary English word opinion does not imply, as they want it to imply, lacking truth value. And it doesn't even imply that when it appears together with these two other statements. Um, so I, I, I think what it does imply when put together with these two other statements is something unrelated to objectivity. It's, it's this. I think uh, it encourages people to think of true and false in an epistemic sense, which people are already inclined to do. Um, <coughs> So I've taught a, I taught a course on truth at another university, and I teach epistemology, the nature of knowledge and evidence and rationality. And in these classes, we're always distinguishing between what's your evidence and for us some belief or hypothesis, and whether the hypothesis are true, is, is true or not. And this is a very difficult distinction. It's a distinction all philosophers think is you know, just as solid as can be and important to make. And it's very difficult for, for a lot of people to get their, to get their minds around it. Uh, there's, a, there's a strong sort of tradition, habit out there of, of, of treating true and false in epistemic terms, such that what's true is what's strongly confirmed by evidence, what's false is strongly disconfirmed, and something's an opinion if it's, eh, neither. It's, you have a mere opinion if you're making a flat-out assertion, but you really don't have quite enough evidence to make <laughs> such a flat-out assertion. Okay. So I think, I think that that's actually what opinion implies when it's put next to these other two. But then we just have grades of sort of epistemic or evidential support. That's not what Goodwin and Darley want. They want to know, do you think there's a fact, an objective fact of the matter? That's not going to do it. There's some other people out there who, okay, very briefly, I'll, I'll just run through some other, here's another test that they gave of objectivity in another experiment. 
you just you're presented with a statement, and now about those who disagree with you about that statement, what do you think? That the other person is surely mistaken? That it's possible that neither you nor the other person is mistaken? It could be that you're mistaken and the other person correct. Other? If you answered one and three, the other is surely mistaken, or I could be mistaken. You're taken to be an objectivist. You answer two, you're a non-objectivist, again, problematic. Surely, the, again, the ordinary English word surely, when it's used like this, is not, does not express, they want this to be the, what we call the modal dual of, of, of one of these two, Necessi the same kind of necessity and possibility, and it's definitely, it's surely not. Um, when you say that someone else is surely mistaken, you're expressing your strong degree of confidence that they're mistaken. Nothing about objectivity. Okay, I could go on, but I guess maybe I'll go on a little bit more. I'll, I'll, I'll skip forward. In any case, or one last comment. It could be that you're mistaken. That's a statement of humility, fallibility. That's a statement of acknowledging that maybe your reasons aren't as strong. I, I could be wrong. When I say I, I could be wrong, it's, I'm not saying anything meta-ethical. I'm not saying anything about objectivity. I'm just saying I'm not so confident. In any case, there's some problems. And then another forced choice experiment in this sort of same area. We've got a guy. He gave his, he gave his participants three choices. Here's one. About some, sta about some, there's some disagreement, ethical disagreement. Pick one. It's an objective fact, independent of what different people think, that it was not wrong for Frank to hit Ben and for Lisa to shove Nancy so John is right and Ted is wrong. Option two. It's an objective fact, independent of what different people think, that it was wrong for Frank to hit Ben and for Lisa to shove Nancy so Ted is right and John is wrong. That's third choice, even longer. There's no objective fact independent of what different people think about whether it was wrong for Frank to hit Bill, Lisa to shove Nancy. These actions were wrong for Ted, maybe wrong for me, but they aren't objectively wrong. In it. All right. <laughs> Please choose one. <clears throat> All right. David and I came up with this. If someone disagrees with you, is it possible for both of you to be right, or must one of you be mistaken? Okay. So that's our objectivity question. Uh, I just thought I would introduce these others just to sort of know why did we, um, being a, that my, my, Appointment is primarily in philosophy. People ask me, so why, they want to know why I got into stuff like this. And so this is, I felt the need to sort of give a little background here. Why did I get into this? So, um, okay. Part of it was the questions. Other reasons, too. We took this to be a more direct question, such that if someone answered it's possible for you both to be correct, we took that to be the non-objectivist answer and the second to be the objectivist answer. Okay. Um, other past research, other recent research doesn't do control for the degree of controversy of the statement in question. So Goodwin and Darley presented uncontroversial scientific claims about the physical world and compared them to highly contested ethical claims and claimed that whatever difference in answer they received was due to the fact that some were factual and some were ethical. Well, that might be part of the story, but if you're not controlling for Perceive, degree of perceived controversy, it could be something else that's responsible for the answers, the pattern of answers that you get. Okay, there's some other things we tried to control for. One thing that was important to David was the limited age range of many of these studies. Uh, some studies, one study in particular, um, tried to claim that, well, developmental some studies in developmental psychology show that students, or not sure students, children, are objectivist about moral claims. When they're little, they think that stealing is wrong is just as much a fact as any other fact. Um, and then these, these same researchers did, did experiments with uh, university undergraduates and found that they were less likely to be objectivists. And one researcher in particular said, see, you grow out of this naive and childish view that, of moral realism, that there are facts there. But of course, since the age didn't go past 21, 22 of the participants, you know, David suggested, well, David suggested, well, maybe they grow out of that, right? Maybe you just, maybe this is just a stage in which the senior year of high school through college is just a stage and you grow out of that. So we wanted to look at a, a broader age range. So here's what we did. Um, we first of all presented people with, um, you have about, I guess, 24 statements on your handout. We presented eight, a selection of eight to each participant. It's a mix. Everybody got a, a mix of some kind, you know, some factual, some ethical, some contested actual, some uncontested ethical, uh, some taste, even mix of, okay. And then we asked, the first task is, we gave you, of, of these eight statements, please indicate the extent to which you agree or disagree. That's just to get them thinking about the issue. Then we gave them our objectivity question. If someone disagrees with you, 
about each of these statements. So then you go through back the same eight, you go through the same eight statements again. If someone disagrees with you, is it possible for you both to be correct or must one of you be mistaken? And then finally, we ask him this question to see uh, about how much disagreement or controversy they thought there was about the issue. So on a scale of one to six, rate the extent to which you think people in our society disagree. No disagreement at all, extremely large. So though we chose initially statements that we thought would be highly, viewed as highly contested or highly uncontested, uh, we didn't just want to rest content with our own uh, assessments. We wanted, to, we wanted to use participant ratings. Okay. So we had quite a few participants in our first experiment. I'm going to tell you about some others too. We had far more than we wanted or needed, and I'll tell you why in, in just a minute. Um, but we had seventh graders from Orchard Park Middle School. We chose a sort of middle of the road socioeconomic status school, not the Buffalo City Schools, not Williamsville, not Narden Academy or Nichols. Okay. Ninth and twelfth graders from the same school district, some Erie County Community College and students and staff, some UB undergraduates, UB, some UB staff, no faculty allowed, professors are kind of weird. <laughs> I mean, really. Uh, but the reason why we have such a large number is primarily from the UB alumni. They were extraordinarily enthusiastic about participating in an online questionnaire. And they just came in by the droves. Um, and um, they were very useful, too. They wanted to email and discuss the issues and talk. And that was actually very useful. We realized that one of our questions uh, was bad. We threw it out. We realized that there's maybe some prob prob problems in another area. So they're very useful discussions. And so it was, it was nice to see their loyalty to their alma, alma mater coming out in this way. So um, now obviously this is, an, uh, this is what we call an, a convenient sample. It's not representative of Americans generally. So we have a wide swath of ages. Oh, I should mention the ages, ages 12 to 89. I was impressed that there were quite a few people ages 88, 89 that actually successfully completed the task of navigating an online questionnaire. That's, I thought that was... See what a, you, UB, UB's a, must be a good place to educate them well. Anyways, they're unrepresentative geographically, unrepresentative um, educationally, and everybody ba basically has a college degree or is pursuing a college degree who's over 18. So. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you in just a little bit about how we are going to... Th there, there's some conclusions that we can draw, though, from, a, from an unrepresentative sample. If you're mostly concerned with ucog size students that are taking, have taken a research methods class, know that the, so there's some, some re if you're just looking at certain real kinds of relationships between independent variables and dependent variables, um, you can make, draw certain kinds of conclusions about those relationships without, an un without a representative sample. So I'm going to tell you about some of the conclusions we can still draw. And concerning those conclusions that we're not entitled to draw because of lack of representativeness, um, we're setting up a random sample uh, using a random digit dialing procedure of all landlines in, uh, in the continental United States. We've put that on hold for just a little bit so we can do a couple of extra little extra follow-up te tests to, anyway, results are coming now. But let me tell you about what we did find in this first, first uh, our hypothesis in this first ex experiment is, first of all, we thought that the stronger participants' opinion about an issue are, the more likely they're going to answer as an objectivist. Another hypothesis is that, as you I basically said already, the more or suggested already, the more controversial that an issue is, the more likely, sorry, the less likely that people are going to give objectivist answers to anything, whether it's in the factual domain, ethical domain. Perceived disagreement is going to have a, 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 an effect in a predictable direction. <clears throat> We also thought that participants from their senior year of high school through college and maybe just a year or so after college, they're going to be more likely. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry, less likely. A little typo there. Less likely than people younger or older to give objectivist answers to ethical questions. So we predicted a dip in objectivity that you attribute to ethics during these years of your life, but that it would correct itself later on. And in fact, we thought it would steadily increase after 25. Uh, it just should go up and up. OK. So I'll skip some of the other hypotheses. So let me tell you about some of the things that we found. <coughs> so remember, my objectivity question is, our objectivity question is, um, is it, if someone disagrees with you, is it possible for both of you to be correct, or must at least one of you be wrong? Okay. So, for each question, there was each answer that was received, a, one, a score of one was given to somebody's got to be wrong. Score of zero to, well, uh, at least it's possible for you both to be correct. Okay, so sort of just averaging together all responses from the factual domain and all responses from each participant in the other domains. This is what we get. 
On the whole, um, people attribute greater objectivity to factual statements than to ethical or taste, and this um, replicates part of the Goodwin and Darley study in that they saw a similarly uh, slight drop off here. I mean, a, a significant drop off, but greater, greater here. Everything, uh, when you have two and a half thousand people, everything is going to be significant. Every difference is basically is going to be significant at the 0.01 level. Um, so I, you don't see a lot of those. Okay. Something to note, though, about this is for every one of the factual claims, uh, I think the answer is uncontroversially one for every single one on there. Um, um, so one, one thing that uh, we're going to investigate in the future is, uh, although our focus here was originally on ethical objectivism, we, we want to sort of look more into metaphysical objectivism. I mean, there ought to be facts. I mean, these statements, the factual claims are, they concern evolution, age of the earth, geographical claims, global warming. I mean, there's a fact there. You may not know what it is. But it's got to, anyway. So something for further research is why are the factual, why are the attributions of objectivity to factual claims as low as they are? They're still higher, but why are they as low? Something for further, we're going to look into further. Okay. So there's a, big, there's a big range. So this is each question and from the factual domain and the degree of objectivity, average degree of objectivity attributed across the board. So we've got all the way from Exercise, frequent exercise usually helps people to lose weight. People are not very confident at all that there's a fact there. Seems kind of not very smart. And <laughs> all the way up to 0.92, New York City being, if someone disagrees with you about whether New York City is further north than LA, somebody's got to be wrong. Okay. Evolution somewhere in the middle, human evolution in particular, somewhere in the middle, age of the earth over here. Okay. When it comes to attributing uh, objectivity to moral claims, our lowest was anonymously donating a portion of your income to charity is a morally good thing. That's very, very low. Um, and I see the philosophers in the room snicker, so according to our view, these sort of shared few among philosophers, that there's something very, I don't know, isn't somebody right or wrong about that? Um, this fits, though, with other studies that show that um, the, the moral claims that are attributed the greatest objectivity, the greatest seriousness, and are even most likely to be classified as a moral or ethical issue at all, concern violation of rights and harm, unwanted harm being done. And in, in, one, in one study done by a developmental psychologist at the College of Charleston, she found that people, uh, using uh, the same statement that we use, she found that um, people don't even classify anonymously donating a portion of your money to charity as a moral issue at all. She gave. She coded people's answers in a certain way such that things were either just a personal choice or personal had no moral significance one way or the other. It, just lay, it lay outside the moral domain at all. That's where most people put that. In any case, the more, so we've got racism hitting people, robbery, cheating, lying, and so on. Uh, but right here, with these three, we've got euthanasia, stem cells, and abortion, getting very low objectivity ratings about whether they're morally permissible or morally wrong. And, of course, that fits with our hypothesis that the more contested the claim, uh, we'll get, I'll give you, the, the, I'll give you the, the ratings in, in just a moment about how contested people thought they were, but it fits with our hypothesis that the more perceived disagreement within society, the less objectivity you're going to attribute. When it comes to taste claims, all the taste claims are, related, are rated much lower. Beethoven's better than Britney. That got a, that's a lot, good bit higher than some of the others. Um, this is not maybe the best question, but still quite low. Okay, so plotting them all together. On average, remember, factual claims are attributed greater objectivity than others. However, at least um, using this amongst the statements used in our study, um, almost half of the ethical statements used are, are attributed greater objectivity. And basically, every chart you see, the y-axis is going to be degree of objectivity attributed. Pretty m most slides here. More objectivity attributed to almost half of ethical claims than about half of the factual claims. So. So blanket statements like um, people attribute greater objectivity to factual claims than ethical claims, um, well, they can be problematic. If what you mean is on average, then somehow on average collapsing everything together in the, in the mean, yes. Um, okay. Some of the time people even treat some taste issues. So right, this is factual, ethical taste. Some, eth some taste issues are attributed more objectivity than some factual issues. So Beethoven and Brittany versus global warming. Um, people may be more inclined to attribute 
uh, more objectivity to, to some things like Beethoven versus Brittany. Okay. So here's one question about this data. Do the strength of belief influence the object, or at least I should say correlate with, um, objectivity judgments? So remember we asked people to indicate how strongly they agree or disagree. So what we did is we, in our analysis, we collapsed strongly disagree and strongly agree together, and then the next two in sort of mildly, I don't know, agree somewhat, disagree somewhat, we collapse those together and similar for the two middle points. And then we looked for correlations between strength of opinion and objectivity rating. This is what we found. So we've got factual, ethical, and taste. And then the blue is people who had a strong opinion on one end or the other, doesn't matter what it was, and then a medium strength opinion and so on. And so we've got our uh, sort of <coughs> correlation uh, coefficients over here. And we see that the stronger an opinion you have about a factual domain, uh, it does influence the degree of objectivity. So the greatest objectivity by a good bit, was, which is attributed in each of these domains when you do have a strong opinion. The lower your opinion, the less strong your opinion, the less objectivity you attribute. And also you can see that on the whole, people just had, oh anyway. Anyways. So strength of opinion does, does uh, strength of opinion does influence. However, people tended to have stronger opinions about ethical matters than either factual or taste claims. So does strength of opinion matter? Yes, how strongly you have an opinion one way or the other that, 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 that influences objectivity that you attribute. But people attribute greater objectivity to factual claims than ethical claims, even though they hold, str slightly, they, they hold slightly stronger opinions uh, in the ethical domain. Another question we can ask is how strongly do s strength of belief Oh, I had that backwards, didn't I? <clears throat> okay. I introduced this task one. Oh, yes. Sorry. I remember now. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it just took me a second. Um, just, just to show you something, uh, if objectivity, judgments, if we break it down by question, that's all I'm doing here, just threw myself for a loop there, just breaking it down by question. Objectivity questions on the y-axis, the particular question is this way, except for this outlier concerning exercise, very, very roughly speaking, um, the red data series is equivalent to the, the, the blue one, where blue is um, how strongly do you feel about the issue one way or the other, ordered from lowest degree of strength of belief? And then red is your objectivity question. How much of an object, how objective do you think the issue is? Roughly speaking, they sort of over, they intertwine, again, except for the one outlier. And all I wanted to show you is that when it comes to ethical questions, we see more separation between this is how strongly people on average feel about it, this is how much objectivity on average they attribute, and we see further space open up when it comes to taste claims. So people, so is it true that how strongly you feel about an issue influences the degree of objectivity you attribute? Yes, but people are able of, um, they're able to make a distinction though bet between how strongly they feel and the objectivity they should attribute. There's a regulation of influence, but they're able to recognize that even though I strongly have, have strong opinions here in the taste, in the area of taste, there should be some, I shouldn't attribute so much objectivity. Okay. A little bit more, uh, a little bit less space there in the, in the ethical domain. Okay. Another question we can ask is, does perceived disagreement, how much controversy you think there is in society, does this influence objectivity judgments? And it does influence objectivity judgments in all three domains, factual, ethical, and taste. So again, on this axis, objectivity. A degree of objectivity attributed. On the, the x-axis, the perceived degree of disagreement from one, there's no disagreement in our society at all towards, uh, I forget exactly how I worded it, an awful lot, roughly speaking, an awful lot of disagreement. So one thing to notice is up here, when we have an ethical, so blue is factual, red is ethical, when we have either an actual or ethical or a factual question that's perceived to be a settled, uncontroversial matter, the degree of objectivity attributed to both the factual and the ethical statement 
is the same. Um, it's the same in our study. So about some issues, I mean, if, if it's taken to be settled, people are, are willing to be fairly strong moral objectivists about it. Um, but then as the more, the more controversial it becomes, the more the perceived degree of disagreement, um, degree of objectivity goes down. Um, the, degree of the, 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 the strength of the correlation uh, between these two is strongest for ethics as in the past one. In other words, ethical claims, the degree of objectivity you attribute to ethical claims is more strongly influenced by perceived <coughs> disagreement out there than in the other domains. It's more sensitive uh, than either taste claims or factual claims to so there being disagreement, distances out there. Um, okay. And similar, similarly for taste. Okay, so does, does the increased degree of controversy lead people in a significant way to attribute less objectivity? Yes, but again, people are able to make certain kinds of distinctions nevertheless. This is how controversial on average are all the factual claims and all the ethical claims and all the taste claims. So they still thought that on average uh, the ethical claims were more controversial. So they're able, degree of controversy influences them, but not so much because although they recognize more controversy here, they still attribute more objectivity to factual domain. So it's a complex relation. Okay. Now, uh, a key question that we were interested in, uh, particularly David was interested in, is, is to what degree is age, stage of life correlated with objectivity judgments? Now here, of course, we're, we're entering an area where it's... Uh, because we don't have a representative sample, uh, we're not going to be able to draw the kinds of conclusions we want to. We can draw, uh, we can be fairly confident in the conclusions that we want to draw about the early th earlier things that I s I've said. Um, what kind of relationship is there between perceived disagreement and objectivity attribution? So we can, we're on good footing with drawing some conclusions there. Okay. But what about age? So this is what we found. <clears throat> so we grouped people into these stages um, based on hypotheses. Ages 12 to 16, senior year of high school, roughly through 25, that age, 26, 39, 40, 59, 16 over. Okay, so here's what we see overall, again, collapsing off. This is degree of objectivity attributed to all factual, ethical, and taste claims treated together, but divided only by age group. Um, what we see here is that when it comes to factual claims, both factual and ethical claims, the... The 26 to 39 group attributes the highest degree of objectivity here. So the peak is at 26 to 39 in both places. So one of our hypotheses was not confirmed by the study. We thought when it came to ethics, we would, see, we would see a dip. Okay, we did, we did see a dip. And we can break this down, not, not just, we can break this square into pieces. Uh, this, this square represents all ethical claims collapsed together. And when we break it down, we, we see interesting things. But collapsing it all together, we do see the dip we predicted, but we expected that Object, the degree of objectivity attributed would just, to ethical claims would just keep going up the rest of your life. I mean, the, the stereotype is, isn't it the stereotype that, doesn't mean it's an empirically well-grounded stereotype, but isn't the stereotype that the older you get, the more set in your ways you get, the more you think that newfangled things aren't right? Kids these days with long hair and tattoos, and you're just, I don't know, things, that's the stereotype anyway. Well, we didn't, we didn't see it. We didn't receive explicit disconfirmation for it, but we, anyway, we didn't see what we expected. Um, something to note here, I think it is instructive that um, there is this fairly steady decrease, you know, except for over here, but for most of the lifespan, a fairly steady decrease in the degree of objectivity you attribute to, people attribute, at least in our sample, to taste claims. I think that's, that's as it should be. We didn't, I didn't actually, uh, we didn't actually make a, an explicit prediction about that, but that seems like what I would have expected. Oh, we always think that once we see the dead, it's what we would have expected, but it's what I think it's what I would have expected. Um, because young people think that, you know, when you're in these years, the music and clothing and hairstyles and styles generally, you really think those are, they're objectively better than the 90s or the 80s or the 70s. I thought that. I grew up growing up as a teenager in the 80s. I thought our stuff was objectively better. But then you get older, you say, I've seen those jeans come and go. It's baggy to skinny to baggy. It'll be baggy again, you know. And, you see things come and go, and so I think that seems, seems right, that you gain a bit of wisdom about the conventionality underlying the, some matters of taste. That seems right. 
Okay, another, another point about this data is this. You'll notice that uh, <coughs> with ages 12 to 16, we're right around 0.5 when it comes to degree of objectivity attributed to both factual and ethical cl claims. My first thought when I saw this data was, um, great, we have refuted, at least some people who think that from early childhood to late childhood through early adolescence, whatever, you're a hardcore moral objectivist and objectivist about everything. So I thought, great, these are, this is lower and it gets bigger. It doesn't, doesn't start high and then dip later. It's, I mean, it starts lower and goes up. That was my first thought. Then there, here's my second thought. I'll get to my third in a minute. But my second thought is, uh-oh, those are around 0.5 on average. Like if you give someone a task and they have no idea what you're asking, but you force them to circle or make a choice anyway. What kind of distribution of responses are you going to find? Uh, 0.5. If, it, if it's just one or the, or the other, it's going to be somewhere in the middle, randomly distributed. It's a, it can be a sign of they just don't know what they're doing. Okay, so I was worried. I was like, oh, dang. Uh, one of the reasons we only, I, I should mention, as you probably, here's something that's been implicit in my talk, but let me make explicit. We use the exact same research materials for all, age, all ages. Same questions. We couldn't go lower than age 12 and have people actually understand the sometimes sophisticated, I mean, there's some degree of sophistication required to understand our questions. But when I saw these two around 0.5, I thought, well, maybe this is already too low, at least the 12 and 13 or something. Uh, but, then I, but, then, uh, but then I analyzed the data further, and I, and I remember a mean, when you calculate a mean, a mean from raw data or from other means or whatever, mean of means, Every time you calculate a mean, uh, the amount of information really shrinks. And so when you go back to, oh my goodness, excuse me. That woke some people up, I think. Okay, <laughs> so when you uh, go back to the data that you calculated the mean from, you can see some interesting things. So what I found is that um, people in this age group, I found that this is misleading. They attributed high degree of objectivity uh, when the, everybody else in every other age group attributed high objectivity and they attributed low objectivity in the same, to the same question. So the, the questions that every other age group thought were most objective, they thought were most objective. The questions that everybody else thought were least objective, they thought were least objective. They were influenced to the same degree by perceived disagreement, just like everybody else. They were, they were influenced by strength of opinion. Okay, so further study is going to be required, but my third thought is... Um, I shouldn't be as worried as I was at my second thought. That uh, I think it seems that they really understood the question. Further investigation is going to be required, but it seems that um, okay, they really do grow in objectivity. Um, okay. All right. So moving on. <coughs> so some of our hypotheses have been confirmed. Uh, we're, this is still very much a work in progress. I had hoped to have this more wrapped up by today than, than, than we did before. Some of you that, if you have, have memorized every detail of the cognitive science colloquium schedule, and you will have noticed that this has already been moved, this colloquium talk was already moved to a later date than earlier, because I wanted more time, and I, I still need, okay, we still need more time. But let me tell you about some of the follow-up experiments that we're, uh, we're, we're currently engaged in. First of all, we asked people whether they agreed or disagreed. Then we asked them how much objectivity they attributed. Then we asked them how controversial it is. In one follow-up, we're just switching these later two. We asked them about perceived disagreement first. And then we're going to ask them our objectivity question to see if making more salient, making them bringing to their attention, getting them to think a little bit more about how much disagreement there is out there, what kind of effect that has. We're doing some, uh, planning to do some other manipulations that prime them to think about disagreement as well. Um, some other things about our study, our first study, is this. Uh, first of all, our, our objectivity question was hypothetical. If someone disagrees with you. Okay, there's no actual person disagreeing with you, so it's hypothetical. And then the someone is, well, this is vague, indeterminate something. There's no person in particular that's hypothetically disagreeing with you. And then we're asking them about if they disagree with you. So they're asked to think about their own opinions from the first person perspective, them versus someone else. So in some uh, follow-up experiments that uh, I have a little bit of data to show you right now, but not, not all of it, we are, we are changing each of these. We're making it actual rather than hypothetical, concrete and determinate, and 
about just two other people that doesn't involve you in some other conditions. So like for example, David S., a sophomore philosophy major, does not believe this. If you disagree with David, does one of you have to be wrong? So there it's actual, it's an actual person, and it's not just someone. I haven't just specified that there's someone that actually agrees, it's someone in particular. There's some concrete details provided. How about two people that's actual, it's somewhat concrete, but it doesn't involve someone disagreeing with you. It's not David disagreeing with you, just two people. Oh, well, two particular people. David and Caitlin disagree. Is it possible for both of them to be correct? Okay, and, and vari other variations. Let me just show you, and we're also looking for some individual differences. Or we hypothesize that the more empathetic you are, the more, like, the more likely you are to think, that, oh, we, we could both be, right? Don't, or I don't know. You can put yourself in the other shoes. And we're looking for individual differences. But here's what we have so far. Our red line, you'll notice, is incomplete because not all the data is collected. But when we contrast, the this is a degree of objectivity attributed to uh, just moral claims. And here's our original data from the first experiment with all the, includes all the alumni. What happens when we make the people uh, that might disagree with you more concrete in some respect? This is a concrete person disagreeing with you. And here's two concrete people disagreeing with each other, not you. Okay, except for this, except for that one, ignore that one. That's what you do with unwanted, no, I'm kidding. Um, except for that one, you'll notice that when we make it concrete and a uh, actual, <laughs> as opposed to hypothetical, the degree of objectivity goes down. So this, this fits with the hypothesis that we have in this part of, the, of our, our follow-up study. Um, you know, as long as it's, if, it's, 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 it's easier to be an object, objectivist. It's easier to think that the other person, or at least somebody, has to be wrong if it's more abstract, but when someone, when it's someone in particular, David S. or Caitlin or whoever, uh, or if there's even a picture, so we're going to use uh, another follow-up, we're going to use uh, faces from some other research, from, uh, drawing inspiration from some other research in social psychology, we're going to have actual pictures, here he is, uh, and the face is going to be manipulated in various ways. Um, it's harder to as we predicted, it's harder to be a moral objectivist there um, when it's someone concrete is sort of staring you in the face, or at least someone concrete is given to you. Okay. So, before I go on to tell you one more about uh, a few other empirical results, let me just say this. So far, what have we seen? Philosophers that I quoted early on in my talk today claimed, well, the folk, the ordinary person out there, they're all thoroughgoing moral objectivists. They think that moral claims to say stealing is wrong, you ought to keep your promises and so on. This is fact-stating discourse, just as much as scientific claims about the physical world is fact-stating discourse. So the research so far suggests that that's mistaken, that people are not straightforward objectivists. Um, and also I think suggests that the view of the average college freshman or sophomore um, among the, the view that's the average uh, common amongst philosophy professors is also mistaken. The view is facts, the, the view is moral discourse really is fact stating discourse, and any college freshman that comes into my class and says otherwise is thoroughly confused. So confused in a way that I've got to squash their belief. Um, that doesn't seem to be correct either. I mean, we see people of all ages responding with lower objectivity ratings uh, in certain predictable ways when there's more disagreement, when there's. Uh, less strongly held opinions when the cases, the questions are presented more concretely. Um, okay, so I, d I don't think that the folk are going to be objectivist in the way that we've always claimed. But I don't think they're going to be simple-minded, simplistic relativists um, in, in a way that can be easily refuted either. I think that folk relativism is going to be multi very multidimensional. Let me just show you one more dimension of folk relativism. Here's a study undertaken by uh, Hagop Sarkissian. Uh, a team of uh, philosophers and psychologists. Um, he's going to have people disagreeing, but he's going to vary, vary things in a different dimension than we have done. This reveals, I think, a different dimension of folk moral relativism. So here's a student. The picture is included in the study. Uh, Hagop teaches at Baruch College in, uh, in New York City. Here's Sam. Sam comes from Poughkeepsie. He likes football, going to the beach. Okay, he's a regular guy is the idea. However, Sam has very different moral views than most of his fellow students. Now consider 
the following moral claim, the following statement. Horace finds his youngest child extremely unattractive and therefore kills him. Something that ought to be beyond the pale, right? It's just, you know, it's, it's just like some philosophy professors when they teach intro to ethics talk about statements like, like this, like torturing infants for the fun of it. Is that okay? You know, and students say, why are you even bringing that up? Okay. Um, so it's a statement that's intentionally chosen to be beyond the pale, and I'll show you why. It's important. It's a good thing that it's so extreme. Okay. One of your classmates, here's somebody else. That, this was done just with students at Baruch College. One of your classmates hears this case and thinks that what Horace did was morally wrong, but now suppose Sam hears the case. Remember, he's a regular guy, just like you. Uh, he thinks that what Horace did was okay. Given that these individuals have different judgments, we would like to know whether you think that at least one of them must be wrong. Or whether you think both of them could actually be correct. I think Hagab got his particular objectivity question from us. Didn't so, um, in other words, to what extent would you agree or disagree with the following question? Since your classmate and Sam have different judgments, at least one of them must be wrong. Okay? Then what they did is they varied the culture condition. They introduced not Sam, a regular guy like you, um, the Mamelons, a hypothetical group of people, isolated tribe living in the Amazonian rainforests. Um, the surrounding areas are now controlled by technologically advanced civilization. They've struggled to hold on to their traditional cultures. In, rest, in the rest of this description, you're told it's a warrior culture. Okay. Horace finds his youngest child extremely unattractive and kills him. One of your classmates thinks this is bad. Not the Mamelons. <laughs> oh, and must one of them be wrong? And then we include an alien condition. Uh, I won't read it because you get the idea. But here's what they found. We're, they're varying cultural distance. Same culture. I mean, you're told Sam's a regular Baruch college student just like you, all the participants. Mammalons, a different hypothetical culture, extraterrestrial, and just like in our study, this is degree of objectivity. So degree of, degree of objectivity goes down, okay? Even with a statement about which, you know, it's crazy to think that two people, isn't it crazy to think? I don't know. Philosophers are going to think it's crazy to think that we might both be right. I think killing your son because he's unattractive is just absolutely horrible. But hey, if someone disagrees with me in a distant culture, maybe that's okay. Maybe we could both be right. Um, so in, he intentionally chose an extreme case so, such that if we do find a variation in a cultural condition, and even that it would be, it would be very telling, and I think it is. There's some other cultural variations. He varied the culture of the actor, not just the, very, not just the, the judger of the action, but the person in act, acting as well. So I think there's another dimension of folk moral, well, it, further study is going to be required, but I think it suggests another dimension of folk moral relativism. We're more objectivist when we're making judgments about same cultures, the more culturally distant the actors, and so on, the less objective the average person is, is likely to be. So uh, I think this complicates the dialectic. Remember Michael Smith and the moral problem and uh, what a lot of other meta-ethicists meta say. Um, they're predicting we're going to be, the folk are going to be straightforward moral objectivists. I think this shows that we're not going to be. Um, our goal with this study and the follow-ups we're doing is to contribute to the, contribute to the philosophical debate. Um, moral realists, people who think Philosophers that think that moral discourse is fact stating discourse, objectively true or false. Moral realists think that they have kind of like squatters' rights. They think that there's these people called, variously called non cognitivists, moral anti realists, expressivists. They think that when you say stealing is wrong, you're not stating a fact. Like, uh, just to give you a, a brief example, um, a couple of years ago I, brought a, I bought a New York Yankees hat just because I wanted a navy blue hat. I quickly realized that Yankee's hat is not just a navy blue hat. <laughs> and one of the students, grad students in our department, Shane Babcock, saw me with the hat and he said, boo. Okay. <laughs> now, ask yourself this, this, did Shane say something true or false? When he said boo, did he say something true or did he say something false? Well, he didn't say either, right? He communicated something to me, his dislike of the Yankees, but not by making, not by uttering a statement that was true or false. So these people called non-cognitivists or moral anti-realists or expressivists, their view about mora moral discourse is something like that. They have, it's more sophisticated than my little example might suggest, but the, the idea is when you say stealing is wrong, 
you can successfully communicate a variety of things, but not by saying something that's true or false, either one. So this collection of views, this anti-realist views, in philosophical debates, they, these, because these people defend views that are said to be counterintuitive, departures from common sense, um, it's, they're taken to have a really uphill battle because common sense is supposed to be objectivist, thoroughly, completely objectivist. And so they're taken to have to require stronger arguments to prove their case than the moral realist. The moral realist can say, I'm, I'm just a default view. I don't really have to argue as strongly as these other guys because I'm the, I'm the common sense view. I think, that, so evidence is coming in that's suggesting that it's not the common sense view at all. So that change, it doesn't solve the meta-ethical debate, but it contributes, I think this empirical data contributes to it. It contributes to the way the debate is framed. Uh, it contributes to certain sheds light on certain kinds of claims that philosophers might want to make, that moral realists maybe don't have what I call, what actually Hagop called squatter's rights. Um, and that, and that, that seems right. So this is how, um, <coughs> okay. So this is our study and how we've tried to contribute to the debate on moral objectivism. So thank you very much.